This is Duke University. The chapel is currently has an exhibit of, um, called Faces of Freedom that documents children who've been rescued from child labor through the efforts of um, an organization called Rugmark and their Good Weave certification efforts. Um, so, um, what Good Weave does is certify that rugs have been made um, free of child labor. Um, it's rugs from South Asia, and when. Christy and when we got together with her and talked about what we might do in um, coordination with that, the issue of certification was one that certainly seemed appropriate for an ethics institute and the chapel to work together on. Just um, what is it that certifiers are doing? Um, you know, what is their role in creating social change if that's what they say they're doing? Um, and what are their goals? Um, these are questions that connect to the big questions that we ask um, both the chapel and the Keenan Institute. How ought we to live? And in this particular case, we can say, how ought we to buy, I suppose? And how do certification efforts help us make those decisions um, if we're at the consumer end of this? Um, the panel today is going to be discussing these issues from a few different perspectives, but there's some big general issues that we've talked about among ourselves in advance of this. Certainly one of them is just what is certification? You know, what is this thing? Um, Chris McDonald, who's on the panel, he's written some about this um, in, in his business ethics blog and his food ethics blog. Just, you know, what do we think certifiers are doing? What do we think a certification means? And then when you read the fine print, what have they actually done? So um, that's one of the questions we'll be looking at. Um, why, does, why does certification exist? And this is one of the things that, that all of the panelists have dealt with. Tim has addressed this question just in terms of how private regulation steps in where governments can't do a very good job for various reasons, or um, where governments really want private actors to take on that role for various reasons. Um, so that's one way of looking at it, but certification also exists because, maybe because consumers want some reassurance that their ethical standards being followed. So there's, there's, there are different pressures that lead to certification um, happening. And then, um, how effective is certification at um, achieving its stated goals? So when um, a certifier says that it's producing, you know, that, that a rug has been produced free of child labor, how do we know that that's happened? Or if it's um, said forest stewardship, that the forest is being preserved, how do we know that that's happened? And is it achieving broader social change that we often think accompany these sorts of, of efforts? That usually we're not just interested in a forest being preserved, but in some greater social good, community good that, that stems from that. Um, the <coughs> issues of transparency about the certification process would be things we'll talk about. And also issues of alternatives. I mean, it's great to say, or maybe not great to say, it might be easy to say, well, it's not doing what we think it's doing. But then the other question is, well, what choices do we have? What are the alternative approaches that might be taken? Um, so we'll be looking at how sort of it affects producers and workers, um, the certifiers themselves, corporations and retailers, and the consumers who are making choices on this end. So the panelists today are, um, I started that in, Chris McDonald, um, who is an associate professor at, um, in the philosophy department at St. Mary's University in Halifax, Canada. He's also a visiting scholar now at the Clarkson Center for Business Ethics and 
Board of Effectiveness at the Rockman School of Management. I'm looking, your, your bio changed a <coughs> lot. And um, his connection to us is that he's a non-resident senior fellow at the Keenan Institute for Ethics. He writes um, a popular business ethics blog, a food ethics blog. He was just going down the long list of blogs that he's involved with. Um, but those two are the two that are most connected to the topics here. Um, and he just um, was awarded um, or named one of the top 100 thought leaders in trustworthy business behavior by Trust Across America. So you've been certified trustworthy, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so welcome, Chris. Thanks Thank a lot you. for being here. Next is <coughs> Greg Dees, who's the co-founder of the Center for the Advancement of, of Social Entrepreneurship at Duke Scoopla School of Business. Um, he previously taught at Yale, Harvard, and Stanford. Um, so he's been a busy man moving around around the country and um, trying out various ventures. His, his work has been focused on social entrepreneurship for the past 17 years. In 2007, he received a Lifetime Achievement Award in Social Entrepreneurship Education from the Aspen Institute. And, and Just means I'm getting old. Yeah. <laughs> and he has a PhD in philosophy. Um, so, and, and he's worked in social entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial development in Appalachia, among many other things. So thanks a lot um, for being here with us, Greg. And then Tim Buta. Did I pronounce that correctly? <laughs> I spell it wrong, but I can pronounce it. Um, is an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science here at Duke. And he's been involved with the Keenan Institute for Ethics with a project that Rebecca Dunning here has also been working on, on regulation and governance <coughs> issues. Um, so he's had a, a long connection with us. Um, Tim works on issues of institutional change and, and um, the politics behind private regulation um, and globalization. And he has a book that is forthcoming with Princeton University Press, New Global Rulers, The Privatization of Regulation in the World Economy. And um, we do have some, some information about that that we can pass out. Um, so that's um, our, our introduction. And so we'll start with, actually, Chris, I think we'll start with you. No. start uh, farther from the uh, world of carpet manufacturing and close to some stuff that I know at least a little bit more about, which is uh, food certification, which I know at least a little bit more about in the abstract. So I'm going to talk about ethic, uh, food ethics certification in an era of competing values. And uh, this talk is certified USDA organic. It is made in Canada. Uh, and it is dolphin safe. Uh, no dolphins have been harmed in the making of this presentation. Okay, so consider in an abstract sense what the problem is with food certification. Think about the complex decision problem that's involved with having thousands or maybe millions of food producers making thousands of different products for the consumption uh, with a whole bunch of different salient characteristics that are cared about by nearly 7 billion consumers. And how is it? Think of it, one way of thinking of the, of the problem of certification is how it is that you get information from those thousands of food producers to those millions of food consumers. Now, what do consumers want from their food? What things do we care about when we think about our food? Well, obviously we want it to be tasty and we want it to be cheap. Starting point. Uh, but we also want it to be low fat high fiber and low sodium, ideally. Uh, but then we also want it to be free range, organic, non-irradiated, vegan maybe, kosher, made in the USA, locally grown, low carbon. Uh, obviously not all of us want all of these things, union made, dolphin safe, hand picked is always nice. Um, lots of people want lot of shade grown, not from concentrate. Some people want it specifically not made in China if they're worried about production processes there. Now, these are a bunch of different things different people want in their foods, and a couple of things are worth pointing out. One is that reasons may vary, right? So if you think about a characteristic like organic or like non-GMO or vegan, people can have very different reasons for wanting certification or for uh, assurance that their food has these characteristics. Notice also that some of these characteristics are going to cluster kind of naturally. So if your food is locally grown, it's also other things being equal, likely to be low carbon. 
If your food is uh, organic, it's also likely to be non-GMO. Those are going to tend to go together, though not perfectly. Um, and notice also that, of course, each of these can be subject to all kinds of critical scrutiny. Right? We can have lots of uh, discussion about the extent to which any of these uh, is important to us, ought to be important us, to us, and so on and so forth. Now, what can food producers and consumers do in the face of the, all of these different uh, characteristics of food? Well, one is that we can try and aim for what amounts to, in some sense, ethical foods overall. Now, we face two kinds of problems here, and if we're going to try and sort out which combination of values adds up to an ethical food, we face these two problems. One is what we could call epistemic problems, or problems of knowledge gathering. Right? So, on the one hand, it becomes hard, it, we immediately notice that the impact, if we're thinking about something like environmental impact, even just to narrow it down a bit, the impact of various foods can be pretty hard to measure, but lots of people are working very hard to find better and better ways to do that. And the second epistemic problem that is that it's hard even to know what to measure. So we face some practical hurdles there in terms of figuring out which of these things, you know, if I'm really concerned about the environment, should I focus more on the fact that my food is uh, low water or low carbon? Which of those two things is more important? That's just a very, very difficult technical problem. <clears throat> we also face some problems about values, problems like, uh, to start with, we have the conflict between values, right? So if you like your food to be low, uh, water input, but you also like your food to be low carbon input, sometimes those conflict. If you're a fan of lettuce and live in Arizona, your food's got to be one or the other. Either it's got to be shipped in at great carbon expense, or it's got to be grown locally with water imported uh, from somewhere, because Arizona doesn't have a lot of its own. So it's either going to be one or the other. A uh, second kind of value problem has to do with incommensurability. We don't have a single metric. There's no single way to sum up. Here is in, in some measurable way, the environmental impact of this uh, food product or of any other product, even if we narrow it down to something, uh, to a single sort of uh, dimension like environmental impact. There may just be no way of adding up things like uh, uh, resource depletion on one hand, but carbon input on the other hand. There is just no single metric that lets you do math across those different kinds of measures. So think about it this way, what is the ethical food here? It looks a little funny and green, but that's a, a veggie burger and that's a steak, right? So you ask someone, what's the, which one of these is the ethical food? Well, the one on the left is cruelty-free, low carbon, and low water input, relatively speaking, lower at least. But the one on the right is free range, organic, and local. And uh, this is not organic, uh, and it's probably not very local, at least not for most people. So which of these is the ethical food? Well, as soon as you start comparing, the, the value dimensions are going to pull you in different directions. Now, then, of course, you can compare the ingredients. That one's got beef in it. And the one, uh, and I say this as a uh, quasi-vegetarian, This, uh, I have to admit that the ingredients for that one are <laughs> like that. Uh, and so while many of us who are vegetarians or quasi-vegetarians think of this as the virtuous choice, I want to at least problematize that and clarify that you know if what you're looking for, if the information you're looking for about your food has to do with these kinds of value dimensions, your choices are not altogether clear. Another example, or another thing to say is that, look, this isn't skepticism, right? I'm not saying there is no best answer to that question. I'm a philosopher. I'm happy to, to, to inquire into which of these is the more ethical or the less unethical food choice. So I'm not being a skeptical about doing the, that kind of hard thinking and hard argumentation. But really what I'm putting on the table is sort of a pragmatic worry about near-term value agreement, right? Is there any, there's very little chance that in the short term we're going to be able to decide should we certify the steak as the ethical food or the veggie burger as the ethical food. Another example, which of these salmons uh, do you want for dinner? Um, this one is a wild salmon. Lots of people love wild salmon. This one's organic. And you can't have it both ways. Wild salmon's never organic because you can't control what it eats. And if you can't control what it eats, you can't certify that it's organic. And if it's organic, it can't be, it means you've controlled what it eats, so it can't be wild. Lots of people like both of those characteristics. They want organic food and they want wild, free-range food, but you can't have both when it comes to salmon. Um, so another option for what food producers and consumers can do is to use brands and certifications to facilitate choice, to help them line up values between producers and consumers. So think of brands 
and certifications, and really certifications like Goodweave are a kind of brand. They're kind of a non-commercial brand, but they're a brand nonetheless. So brands and certifications, their whole role, the whole reason we have roles is to simplify consumer choice and to inform consumers about which things it is, uh, which products they uh, can buy that are helping them meet their needs. So in the sense in which I'm interested in here, we can, we can think of brands and certifications as clusters of values. So each of these different brands, if you will, broadly speaking, encompasses a certain set of values, right? You could add on here, you know, your favorite retailers. Put the Walmart brand up here and the, you know, Brooks Brothers brand. And think about what clusters of values those brands embody and how it is that they let producers and consumers communicate. So think of, you can think of the challenge this, this way. This is a highly idealized, obviously. You've got a bunch of food producers here, or rug producers for that matter. You've got a bunch of consumers, and they're basically trying to do business with each other, forming allegiances and alliances, trying to convey information back and forth about product characteristics, about demand. And what brands and certifications do is they act as a kind of mediator. right? So um, uh, a, a certain brand takes products, this may be a store brand like Walmart that takes products from a couple different consumers and conveys a certain value message to consumers who then uh, decide whether they want to buy that brand. And so brands help us. They're sort of a medium for communicating with producers. Now, help, it's helpful a bit here to see what economists tell us about three different kinds of goods to clarify the role that these brands are playing. One is what economists call search goods. Search goods are goods that, such that uh, you know that you, you know them when you see them. You know that the, when you so in the food realm, uh, if you're looking for some parsley as a garnish on your dish, you know as soon as you see it that that's the bit of parsley you want. It's green. It's crisp. It's got exactly the characteristics, and you can spot it as soon as you see it. Contrast that with what economists call experience goods, goods like chocolate, right? Which you you know once you taste it whether it's the chocolate you wanted, but you can't tell usually at a distance. Contrast that again with what they call credence goods. Credence goods are ones where, well, you've got to take someone's word for it. Even after I take the vitamin supplement, I still don't know whether it did what I wanted it to do, which was to boost my B12 levels. All I, ha I have to take the word of the nice people at Jameson for that or and trust that they are sufficiently afraid of the relevant regulatory agencies. Now, so we have search goods, experience goods, and credence goods that involve different levels of um, knowledge on the part of consumers. Now, more accurately though, uh, is to think of it in terms of characteristics of goods rather than entire products. So think of this question. How do you like your eggs? What kind of eggs do you like to buy? I like my eggs large and brown. I like them tasty and I like them free range. Notice that that's a search good, large and brown. I can, as soon as I see them, I know those are big brown eggs. Experience goods, I won't know until I try them. But this is a credence good. I have to take someone's word for it that those eggs are free range. And so reliable labeling, whether it's certification or some kind of trusted brand name, turns credence goods into search goods, right? So as soon as I see this, if that's a reliable certification, as soon as I see it, I know that that's the kind of product I want. Now, brands and certifications, therefore, act as a kind of mechanism for aligning values, right? But only if they're reliable. And we're gonna obviously talk about that a bit more as our afternoon goes on. And they also allow, and I think this is an interesting fact about them, they allow sort of value-driven diversity among consumers, right? So some consumers can say, look, my big commitment in the world is cruelty-free. Your big commitment in the world might be environmental issues. And they allow consumers to line up with producers when there is controversy about what the best way is to do something, right, about what the key characteristic of the product really is, it allows consumers and producers to line up. But there are, of course, limits. Uh, brands and certifications, uh, and particularly people have talked about this in terms of certifications, there's always some cost involved. Someone's got to gather some knowledge, verify it, and that cost has to be paid by somebody. Uh, there are problems of comprehension. So when, you're, when, the, when your bag of potato chips says non-GMO, um, I would wager that there isn't one consumer in a hundred that can tell you accurately what that means. Uh, I'm not sure I can tell you accurately what, I, what it means, and I've written uh, a, a, at least one published paper on it. Um, there's also the disincentives to achieve more moderate goals in some cases. So some people have written about the fact that once you've got, once USDA organic is a specific hurdle, right, there's no rewards for getting up to 90% of that hurdle because you don't get 90% of the rewards of that specialized market. You're just considered non-organic, even if you're doing nearly as well. 
So summarizing, what can be done in the face of sort of product variation, products that vary along all these different dimensions? Well, one is you can produce, you can aim at producing just ethical food, the one that has all the right characteristics, but that's, I think there's limited prospects for that in the short term. Or you can focus on branding and certification, but only carefully. Now, as a postscript, all I've said so far focuses on consumer autonomy. It says, how do you let people make choices effectively by giving them the right kinds of information? Now, political scientist John Elster uh, had a useful uh, addition to this, what I think is a, a useful but limited way of framing the issue. And Elster says, the notion of consumer sovereignty is acceptable because and to the extent that the consumer chooses between courses of action that only influence themselves, right? If the product choice is only going to affect you, then it's great that you get to choose. In political choice situations, however, the citizen is asked to express his preferences over states that also affect other people. And as uh, Michael uh, Korthals uh, has written, uh, the emergence of the concerned consumer strains this neat distinction, right? So we tend to think of consumer autonomy in terms of choosing products that meet your needs, but in 2011, well, obviously, it's going on a decade since Korthals uh, wrote this, we have concerned consumerism of a kind that says, well, we don't believe exclusively in this distinction anymore. So while I think it's useful to think about the ways in which brands and certifications help us align, line up with producers that uh, meet our particular interests and value systems, clearly that can't be the end of the conversation. Uh, and there's uh, just, uh, that's, that's my last slide, and there's just a bunch of, bunch of the many, many logos, as uh, I've been tempted to joke a few times, product packages are gonna have to get bigger if you're going to start getting this many different um, value-laden uh, product certifications onto them. Okay. Thanks. Okay, next will be Tim. Thanks. I want to do three things. Um, the first one is actually in the set of questions that you emailed us in advance. Um, there was one that I thought would be worth uh, trying to address from my reading of the literature more than necessarily my own work. Uh, was, is there a risk that these market-based approaches to social change crowd out more radically and ultimately in more effective ways? And obviously one of the things that we are often concerned with with social certification or other private means often market-based means of regulating markets is that enforcement is weak um, and therefore effectiveness may be low. Um, if those private actions then reduce the incentive to actually push for governmental action, which presumably if you have um, an effective, um, reasonably powerful state, which of course in large parts of the world is still a big if, um, then uh, those alternatives, uh, if the incentive to push for those is thereby reduced, you might actually crowd out this more effective. Most of the literature, as I read it, suggests that that is extremely rare and that what's far more common is, in fact, that when these private NGO-based or other civil society-based um, regulatory uh, measures come into play, um, it brings some of those who are targeted by them um, on board, um, causes some to change their behavior, and therefore reduces political opposition to ultimately actually generalize these um, initially semi-voluntary private um, rules, um, and thereby in fact makes more effective, longer lasting, and if you want more radical um, action, in fact, more likely. Um, you didn't ask that question at the beginning here, but since you had suggested that we Thank should address that, that. Uh, I, I thought it would be an important issue to maybe um, talk about, and at least that's my reading of, of literature on that. The second is to um, suggest to you uh, one way to think about some of the issues involved here. Um, I, I drew this figure um, out of a dissatisfaction with more traditional sort of political economic models of private regulation, and I tend to think of um, standards and regulations that are, and, and, and the certification of compliance with them that are happening outside of the governmental realm as essentially a form of private regulation. Um, and uh, there are various um, 
uh, colleagues from, from different disciplines that have used um, at least the terminology and sometimes quite specific um, uh, formal or empirical models of supply and demand as a way to understand these phenomena and, and they get us a certain amount of purchase. Um, but I think there's a danger in using that terminology and that it conflates in the realm of private regulation um, often what are what I would term here the rule demanders um, and the targets uh, of the rules. Um, these three groups, in fact, I, I think are three major subsets um, of the stakeholders in private regulation in general. Uh, there may be others. Uh, there may be situations where stakeholders that are not captured by any of these three groups actually constitute a very large share. Um, there may be some cases uh, where there's hardly anybody else. Um, the, the idea is here to separate those who really ask for the existence of private rules, standards, and certification of compliance therewith um, from those who actually write those rules um, and maybe in this particular case also do the certification um, from the third group, namely those whose um, behavior is supposed to be changed as a consequence of these rules or at least um, the, whose behavior these rules target. Um, now there are cases of course where these three groups may nearly perfectly or maybe even completely perfectly overlap. This is where we're in the realm of essentially the ideal type of self-regulation um, which uh, or the ideal type of self-governance um, or government uh, which we tend to associate uh, positive values with um, and in that case there would be very little justification um, for uh, being concerned with wanting to see government involved for instance um, or having any other kinds of normative concerns about it. Uh, but it also suggests, though, that to the extent that these three groups do not overlap, particularly to the extent that there is a divergence between the rule makers, um, that is, those who, who write, supply the rules, if you want, and the target of the rules, uh, we're dealing with a situation where there are relationships of power um, and where um, political analysis, I think, needs to be at least part of both any kind of normative analysis or um, uh, just a, a positive analysis uh, that we might be involved in. So why do any of these groups actually um, demand, supply, or comply with privately developed rules? Um, rule demanders often are civil society groups, um, and in many cases thereof, and uh, this comes out of uh, the introductory piece for a special issue of business and politics, uh, which came out a few months ago, which has several empirical illustrations of some of these dynamics. Um, often they come out of civil society um, groups, more or less previously organized, out of a dissatisfaction uh, with government regulation to deal with certain externalities of economic relationships, particularly prominently so when those economic relationships cross borders, and therefore the polity essentially no longer coincides neatly uh, with the size of the market. Um, they uh, might also, of course, be in fact the target of the rules, or some of those who are target of the rules. And in fact, we see in a good number of cases, um, firms, producers, uh, who are uh, then to be the ones who follow those rules and might be certified for it, in fact, being the source of demand for it. Um, this may be, in fact, a, a protectionist measure by those who are already complying with relatively high standards um, for any number of reasons, maybe because they have a very sophisticated technology available to them, uh, maybe because they have been subjected to local pressures um, for good labor practices, good environmental practices, or whatever the case may be, and they want to get market recognition for that, maybe even push others out of the market, um, by raising the standard for everybody, if you're a high cost, a high quality producer, you might get rid of some pesky competition. Um, rule suppliers, um, those who actually write the rules are often not the same, particularly when this is concerned with relatively technical issues, which arises in the environmental realm as well as many, many food safety issues. Um, so it requires often the kind of technical expertise that particularly civil society groups don't easily have available to them. Um, and because it requires expertise, and, and particularly if you don't just want to write rules and, and 
thin demand wall, but actually get them made available to those who might follow them. It requires some amount of resources to actually disseminate them. All of that is costly. Um, so it raises, I think, inherently the question of why one would actually um, produce what at least to some extent is a public good um, of these private rules. Um, and most of the research here in my reading suggests that, um, in fact, it's never purely a, a public good. Um, and that there are virtually always also private benefits to be gained and that the incentive for those who actually write the, good, the rules is almost always uh, the desire to capture some of these private benefits. I gave you an example a moment ago um, how firms may, for instance, demand private rules in order to generalize standards with which they're already complying but their competitors are not. Um, in those cases, they have a great incentive to, in fact, be providing to, to write supply the rules um, as well, uh, but those are not the only ones. If you think that through traditional governmental processes, whether at the domestic level or internationally, in international governmental organizations, the outcome is going to be different from what you might be able to achieve through private processes, um, whether more stringent or less so. Um, this goes for both, say, the, the strong environmentalists and, and firms that try to maybe um, oppose or avoid environmental obligations, um, then pushing the decision-making, pushing the rulemaking into um, the private forum may be uh, perfectly um, sensible and, and, and there may be incentive for that in order to achieve different outcomes, in that sense, capture private benefits. Um, finally, tired of rules, um, and these in, in the economic realm usually are firms, of course, um, have quite sometimes an incentive to comply with private rules because actually governments end up integrating them into laws and regulations. Um, and uh, several of the labels that I think somewhere or other on your slides mm -hmm. showed up uh, have, have taken on that role, even though they were initially developed entirely privately and initially offered only for voluntary compliance. Um, but even when governments don't require um, compliance, uh, there are often a host of political, economic, and legal incentives to comply. These range from consumer expectations. Um, one of my favorite examples here is um, a ski safety standard that the Japanese Consumer Safety Association developed in 1986, which required skis to have a certain thickness and width um, in order to get the safety seal. And it so happened that the uh, level of thickness and width that was required uh, was not met by any of the major international ski manufacturers. Now, they had a very quick answer to why that was so, namely because unlike their competitors in the then nascent um, Japanese domestic ski industry, they had actually figured out how to achieve both durability and flex without having to make the skis quite as thick and wide as their Japanese competitors. Um, and so they launched a trade dispute which went on through a few rounds and months. Now, the Japanese Consumer Association had perfectly a uh, good scientific reason for their um, standard, which was that Japanese snow was different from snow anywhere else, or at least in the other ski exporting countries. Um, that didn't go so well, and eventually Japan withdrew the standard, which had been entirely in voluntary realm, but this was a safety seal that Japanese consumers were accustomed to look for when they bought products. And by the time they withdrew the standard, you know, one year sales season had already passed, and because it had become a relatively high profile issue, the reputational damage to foreign manufacturers had been done, and so the sort of entry into the market um, on, on a pretty substantial scale for many of the Japanese um, manufacturers had been achieved. Uh, which is not to say that the Japanese are, are in some any way exceptional about this. Um, US and, and, and European uh, firms are just as bad in using private rules in similar ways. But there may be sort of market expectations that essentially work as uh, market access controlling. Um, there also often uh, is an expectation that private rules, when they're actually made explicit, establish something of a best practice. Um, and so there are legal liability issues. Uh, insurance companies actually sometimes push, quite, quite sometimes uh, push manufacturers to comply with known explicit industry standards because that reduces the chance that they're going to be uh, sued in, in consumer liability suits, um, etc. 
Um, this is essentially the point, I think, where certification comes into all of this. Because there is a concern on the part of, in particular, on the rule demanders, to some extent also on the rule suppliers, that simply declaring that you are complying with a particular rule is not going to be um, sufficient, is not going to have credibility. Um, now, I should point out that in uh, that special issue of business and politics where this comes from, there's actually a, a, a great paper uh, that John and Mr. Urban at the table here with Erica Weinthal, both from the Nicholas School that Duke have written, that uses in particular the kosher labels um, as a way to understand more generally this problem of credibility. And, and in particular, I think they, they very nicely point out how essentially certification pushes that, sort of, that credibility problem so sort of one step down the road without actually really solving it because it immediately raises the question, so who are actually those certifiers? What are they, their interests, which usually at least over time become to some extent aligned with the interest of those whom they certify because without the opportunity to regularly certify them for compliance, they usually would be out of business. And so then you get in some cases literally sort of a certification body that certifies certifiers and, and the sort of chain goes on from there and it maybe trails all the way down but you never really reach the bottom. Um, these are um, issues of accountability on some level but they are, they are far more complex um, than the kind of issues of accountability that I think we're used to in sort of formal uh, public um, systems of, of government and power. Thanks. You're going to be disappointed. I didn't bring any visual aids. I'm, well, gl I'm, I'm glad that I, I'm glad that I wore my most colorful tie. However, for the occasion, um, this is a save the children tie. I don't think it's certified in any way, but it was it was made by Alex H. Five, and it says children feel the warmth of an extended hand. I thought it was appropriate given the good weave mission of uh, preventing child uh, labor uh, in these uh, rug weaving factories. So uh, I'm going to talk about this from a fairly practical point of view. My focus and my work has been with social entrepreneurs, including people who do stuff like this, uh, like certification. Um, but a good part of it is trying to help them think through whether their actions, whether their interventions are actually going to have the intended consequence, which is are they really going to have the impact they want to have, which is to end child labor in uh, factories like this. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that um, and about what I think the limits are of this kind of intervention um, and uh, and then kind of open it up. I'll, I'll try to tie it a little bit to some of what, uh, what Chris has said and maybe a little bit to what uh, Tim uh, has said so far. Um, so as I see it, these certification strategies have really two prongs. So when somebody says I want to I'm worried about child labor, and the, and the, the origin of, of Rugmark was, was with a, a woman who was deeply concerned about um, child uh, slavery issues and child bondage issues, and decided that this might be one way to help, um, to help that cause. Um, and, and so this, would, this particular strategy for doing it said, okay, let's use the power of the marketplace. We'll try to tap into the consciences of consumers to put pressure on companies to change their behavior. So that was the theory behind it. The theory is if, if consumers care enough about this, maybe they'll put their money where their conscience is, and that'll put pressure on the people who are selling these rugs, which will put pressure on the, the, the distributors in between, and it'll put pressure on the manufacturers and all the way back to the plant to change the practices. And that's the theory behind it. We call this a social impact theory. So when we talk to social entrepreneurs about developing their plans and their ideas, we, we urge them to lay out their theory of action. What, what, what do you think you're doing and what do you think the consequences are going to be? What are the assumptions behind that? Are those good assumptions? How are you going to test them? Uh, how will you know if this is really going to happen? But the series of assumptions here are that, you know, we, we, that there are enough consumers that they're going to exercise their conscience and that this is going to, going to have a ripple effect back to the Producers and enough producers are then going to want to have this label 
because they're going to want to be able to certify their rugs because consumers are demanding it. So the theory behind it. Uh, it's usually a two-pronged approach. One prong is really is that. It's tapping into the marketplace and buying power. The other prong is generating general awareness of the problem. So they do a general marketing campaign as well, which they think highlights, spotlights the problem, and they use the, uh, the brand, the seal, as a way of highlighting uh, the issue or the problem. Um, and that just creates some general awareness among policymakers, among other folks, that there's an issue here. An issue that a lot of people may not have thought about before. So when buying an Oriental rug, may not have, you may not have thought about child labor being involved in producing that rug. And now that there's a distinction between rug mark rugs and other rugs, and you may come across that, you may pick up a rug and say, what's this? Rug mark, how is that different from other rugs? Really, child labor? I didn't realize it might be child labor involved in these other rugs. It sort of raises awareness. Or they may have a marketing campaign that, that catches your attention. So, so it, it, even if you don't buy the rug, even if there's not a lot of money, it may just raise your awareness about the issue. So these are the two prongs of the strategy, as I understand it. Um, so when you think about what does the strategy accomplish, I mean, one, on one end, it may accomplish, as Chris said, giving consumers a little more autonomy if it gives them more information. Um, Tim has raised the question of, well, yeah, but how reliable is the information? And you know, we've got to wonder uh, with the certifiers, uh, you know, who certifies the certifiers, and we end up with the turtles all the way back because they join ICL. ICL then certifies these certifiers, and then but who certifies ICL? And, and you end up with the same kind of regression problem. But it's hard to argue, um, it's, not, it's not totally hard to argue against more information in the marketplace because too much information can be totally overwhelming. Um, but in this case, in theory, consumers get a little more information. They may have to sort out conflicting information if they're multiple certifiers making conflicting claims. But in theory, it, it increases consumer autonomy. Um, Though, by the way, on the, the Elster quote, it was never true. It was never true that consumer choices affected only the consumers, um, this, despite the fact that, that we may have believed it to be true or wanted to believe it, that we had a private realm of economic transactions and a public realm of political choice. Uh, economic transactions have always affected a lot more than the consumer. But uh, so <coughs> nonetheless, we've got this. So, so in any case, we, so theory, one, one possible outcome of this is that consumers have a little more information about the products they're purchasing. At the very least, they're aware that there's an issue of child labor being involved in the production of products. So that's one positive outcome. Another positive outcome is some children, some number of children get pulled out of these factories and educated. So good weave, and I'm just using good weave as an example. There are other kinds of certification. We, we have to use those examples to play out uh, the details. Um, so some of these children get put into education. So good weave has some educational programs, rehabilitation programs. They bring the kids back to their families. We don't know for sure what happens after that. We don't know what happens to the family after that. So there are a lot of open questions. I'm going to come back to those in a minute. Um, but, I, but so there's some at least um, initial goods that are created out of this. Consumers are more aware. Maybe they're making better buying decisions if good weed is providing credible information. Um, that may be, that may be a, a good thing. And it may be that uh, fewer children are working in these plants um, and we don't know what else is happening to them, so that may or may not be a good thing. Uh, but in theory, if more of them are going to school than working in the plant, that may be good for the ch child. We don't know what the impact is on the family. So there's another, that's, a, that's another issue. So we've, we've got there. That's the kind of logic behind it, the first argument in favor of it. Um, but these things have their limits. And I think the limits are, are, are serious, and, they, and we have to think them through. So if anybody is thinking about going down this road, um, there's some, some serious uh, limits. Because it depends, the effectiveness of this kind of strategy depends on a number of things relative size of the market, the target market segment that cares. Right? How many people buy an Oriental rug, buying certain kinds of food products, care about this particular aspect of it? We, we don't know. In, in some cases, it's a small part of the segment buying food. In other cases, it's a large part. And sometimes it's a small part of the rug buying market. Sometimes it's large. 
if it's a small part, it may not affect many factories in terms of the buying power of people choosing to buy uh, a, a good wheat growing. Um, how much of a premium are they willing to pay? So what, what kind of sensitivity? How sensitive are they to this issue? How price sensitive are they about this? So you said one of the, pro one of the things people want is cheap. Are they willing to pay a little more for this? And how much more? Are they willing to go out of their way? So Goodweed will say on the website, it's a $10 premium on a $2,000 rug. But you might find that you can only find Goodweed rugs in high-end galleries. So if you're looking for an Oriental rug and you want to buy one in the $700 range, you may find you just can't find a Goodweed rug in a gallery that's offering $700 rugs. You gotta go to a $2,000 gallery. Um, and maybe, maybe that's hard for you or difficult. And so, you, you, there's a whole logic, maybe you've got to drive another 10 miles to find the Goodweed Gallery with the Goodweed rug instead of shopping here in Durham, you've got to go to Chapel Hill. I think that might be the closest gallery to us here, some, someplace in Chapel Hill. So, so what are people willing to do? So how big is the market? Are enough people willing to actually act on this to, to have an effect, to have a market effect, enough of a market effect that it's going to have an effect on the producers? So I think that's a big question that needs to be tested. Um, and any of these certifications, if you're, if if you think the certification is going to have an impact on the other end, um, on the way goods are produced, the way fish are harvested, um, the way wood is harvested, um, then you've got to make sure you've got enough of the demand on the market side uh, to pull it to pull it through. Uh, the second thing is that um, it depends in part on the strength of the standards that are being met and whether those standards are being audited whether there's sufficient inspection, whether they're rigorous enough. And I think that's a, you know, again, that, that varies widely from organization to organization. And one issue that's come up, and it's come up within these, and this is one of the reasons that could, Rugmar joined uh, ICEAL and, and Institute of Good Weave uh, label, um, is that there were other folks out there certifying rugs um, and with lot more lax standards. And uh, that sort of cheapens the market then. You've got competing standards. And consumers often don't know the difference. Um, and what are they to do? They, you know, this one looks just as good as that one. It's a label to me. And how do I know which is better, which has the tougher standards, which is actually inspecting the plans, and which one is just getting a plan to sign a statement and, and is in, maybe, maybe is industry driven in some ways. Uh, um, and and with, with no real auditing or no, no real careful follow-up, um, you don't know. And so it's very hard for consumers to know whether the standards, uh, what the standards are and how, how rigorously they're being, they're being applied. Um, and without rigorous standards, this may not achieve its social impact uh, in the end. And if you have too rigorous of standards, then it may be hard to get compliance on the part of plants. You may get competing, less rigorous um, seals and certifications that will come in and offer to the same plant a deal that's more attractive. So, so it's, a, it's, a, there's, it's interesting to see how that plays out. I haven't seen uh, any good studies on the competition among certifications, but maybe, maybe I just because I didn't read the kosher study and that's... I'll do the next paper. <laughs> okay, which I think would be fascinating on how they compete to, to, with each other. Um, so, uh, also, um, uh, there's another, uh, the producers clearly have to perceive value. I mean, another thing this depends on for its success, the producers see value in adopting this seal. Um, and this and comes back to private value, public value of this thing. It's not just the public good, but there has to be some private, to induce these producers to adopt it, they have to feel like they can capture some private value out of being part of this. And it's, and it does get to be a little bit tricky because even in the case of something like Goodweave, it's, it is the producers who pay a fee uh, for the seal. Um, and they've got to feel that it's worth paying that fee and that that'll, that'll actually get them the premium on their rugs all the way through the value chain to the, to the customer. So I think that's, and you've got to make the, you've got to be able to make the value proposition uh, compelling to them. Um, and then the final piece of this that I want to mention, I want to come back to some of the issues I raised earlier. Um, the, you've got to ask yourself whether there are going to be any other unintended consequences of this action. Uh, let's suppose you are successful in getting uh, factories to adopt this, uh, and I use Goodweed throughout just to give a concrete example. 
getting factories to adopt these standards and stop using child labor. So the child is now no longer working in the plant. Um, could there be some unintended consequences on the family or on the child that, that you haven't taken into account? Um, if the family was dependent on that income, what is the impact on the family? Now, Goodweave says in many cases these are that this is bonded labor, not and the family is not seeing income. If that bonded labor is due to a family debt, what happens to the debt? Is the debt forgiven, or is, does somebody else in the family now have to uh, work out the debt um, through a bond? Uh, what, you know, I don't. I have no idea what the impact is, and so I don't know what the long-term impact on the families are of uh, of these transitions. And it'd be interesting just to to find out and understand what what the impact. Uh, is as you see this uh, all the way through um, through the chain, but just understanding what the intended and unintended consequences are of this. So that's the sort of logic that we take something like this through what we think about it from the point of view of the social entrepreneur, is just trying to understand what your theory of impact is, what, where it could potentially go wrong, um, learning from these two folks because they, they bring um, some incredibly good points that I think social entrepreneurs can certainly can benefit from um, as they think as they think this through and try to figure out how they're creating the, their intended social good or social impact. Um, so I think that um, I, I think the question that, that I would put out there, and I think one that that uh, that is worth anybody who's thinking about certification uh, asking, which is you know, can this be done? How can this be done so it's really a effective and done well, and can it be done in a way that tackles the underlying problem, whatever the causes of the underlying problem? So you've got to ask yourself, in the case of, um, in the case of uh, child labor, why are these kids working? What is it? Why are our families sending them to work? Why are they allowing them to work? Sometimes the kid may be abducted, may be an orphan. So there's some other issues there. But, but why are the kids working? Are there some other structural solutions? That need to be in place. Um, should the certifiers be part of that overall solution? Is there some way to, to, to get at those underlying problems? If it's deforestation, um, that's an issue. Why why are, are cattle farmers in Brazil cutting down rainforests um, to allow their cattle to graze and then trying to understand what how do we solve that problem um, and not just uh, not not just certify lumber but actually get, get at some of these underlying problems. So um, so I think that's, um, maybe I'll stop there, um, but I do think that there's a risk with certification that it can make us feel good as consumers, feel virtuous as consumers. We buy these things and we think we're doing good in the world. Um, and I, I just think it's important to think a little more deeply and for the organizations offering the certification, I know Goodweave is one, one that does think deeply about these issues because it came out of an organization that was looking more broadly at, at this issue of, of, uh, of child labor and child, uh, child slavery and, uh, and various abusive practices for children um, to look more broadly at the, at the policy environment and uh, other sorts of interventions that may address the underlying Underlying problems. So, those are my comments. So, we'll turn now to questions, which also can be panelists asking questions of each other, addressing each other. We'll take questions from the audience. Um, so one thing I often think about is sort of what's the alternative. I think when you sort of when everyone focuses their attention on any policy instrument, I think it's sort of becomes the dominant place where a lot of attention is focused. And I sort of am thinking a lot about this question of what's what's the alternative. So if if certification is um, designed to sort of solve this sort of information asymmetry between consumers and producers, and to sort of allow people to make more values aligned choices, in what, what else is out there that we, what, that we see and think about that could be a plausible option for sort of rectifying that problem, if not, if not certification? Well, to start with, when you think about the full range of certification methods, right? So you can have, you know, uh, NGO certification, you can have government certification, you can have um, pro, sort of private label, you know, for-profit certification. And that's, I mean, that's, those are the three, I'm sure there are other options too. Um, maybe a, 
industry associations probably have some, there are probably some certifications we develop. Um, so at least you might start by thinking about those alternatives. Um, beyond that, I mean, brands are another way to provide something like some of that same information, right? There are some brands that just make it part of their, some companies that make it part of their brand that you just know that we won't, you know, we're not going to be pushing the limits on certain kinds of, uh, of ethical issues and other, com other companies where, you know, you got a cheap product. Um, so that's, that's another way. Um, any other? Yeah, I, you know, I think, I, I think if we have this large cloud that we're calling certification, um, it's, it is hard to think of some other way because third party sources of information is what we're trying to rely on. That's because we, we're, because of the information asymmetry, we're not, um, the, the getting it directly from the other party, even if it's, I mean, the brand helps because the, the brand, um, uh, uh, there is an incentive for you to maintain the reputation that's that's embedded in that brand over time, and so there's there is an, that does solve some of the incentive problem for you to deceive me. Um, so it does it does overcome that uh, a bit, and then third party verification helps, um, and then uh, various forms of third party testing and evaluation help as well. So something like consumer union. Um, helps um, having um, recourse uh, through uh, organizations like a Better Business Bureau, other kinds of organizations when you think that an organization has not lived up to whatever its the explicit or implicit promise was in their in, in the, the deal that you had with them, so if something gets revealed um, in, in a transaction. So having, um, I don't know what the broad label is for that, but um, um, organizations belong to a, um, or being part of a mechanism that gives you an alternative dispute resolution strategy um, so that should should information come to life, you've got a way to uh, try to resolve your dispute with the company over that discrepancy um, later. So there are various forms, of, there could be various forms of guarantees that people can use. So I'm just trying to think now of various kind of game theoretic strategies that people can use that would allow you then later, should should something be revealed, then you get your money back, should it ever be revealed that they, you know, that they've employed child labor or something like that. So if they, if they could do that and put up a bond somewhere, I mean, so you could envision mechanisms like this um, being created so that so that there there is a, you know, a way to provide some reassurance, but it would take you know, some creative mechanisms for people to do that, to say, okay, we've got this, Fund and should you ever should it ever be revealed uh, by investigative reports anybody else in a credible way that we've got we're using child labor in our plant, then the full purchase price of your work would be refunded, and we could we could do something like that. So I think um, companies could try to do this, or associations, or even these certifiers could add that as a as a dimension and cause and ask companies to pay into it, be like an insurance fund. Um, so I. You know, I, I think it'd be fun to kind of to think this through, but I think they, I think we could do things like that. The other thing to say is that it, it's, you know, one of the reasons it's hard to answer that in the abstract is that one of the things people need to know is whether, for a particular value dimension, whether the, whether the whether that concern is sort of solving itself or is sort of a deep problem. Right? So they have two different kinds of resource use, right? If you're talking about companies doing business in a place where they have unlimited access, unlimited and unmetered access to water, I'm going to want some certification that they're actually, you know, using, reducing their water usage because I have no natural reason to trust them. Whereas I don't expect my airline to be certified low fuel usage because they've got a huge natural incentive to keep their fuel usage as low as possible because fuel is one of their biggest costs, right? So you want to think in particular about what, what natural incentive do they have to limit this behavior and it may be a behavior that we're very, very concerned about. We're all very concerned about fuel usage, but it's not one where we specifically need an external certification method, whereas for other cases we might well. Add two, two points. I'm a little bit concerned that relying on brands essentially just pushes the certification problems internal, mm -hmm. which may be a small cost saver. Uh, in, in that you don't have to pay external fees, etc. But the brand name, 
um, producer really has a, a bunch of suppliers, and, and what we're often concerned with with the social labels is actually the behavior by, at the local level by the suppliers, and so you need to have some monitoring mechanism in place there for that to be effective, which then just creates internally the same costs. You just wouldn't see it as a separate um, labeling certification exercise. Um, it, they, I mean, there is, and, and uh, not, not to push this horse too far, but uh, in, in fact, in, in that same issue of business and politics, there's one nice piece that looks at the way in which technological innovations actually can change the costliness of monitoring and make uh, information available to consumers through mechanisms that don't necessarily uh, require some formal certification body or, or uh, mechanism. Um, and so uh, um, um, making the, the, the same technology that allows, for instance, for Google Earth, um, allows you to monitoring without having to send people constantly into the rainforest, uh, whether in fact uh, rainforest is being preserved in the area from which um, the, the lumber that you uh, got comes from, and even that you can increasingly tag at relatively low costs in, in ways that become ever more reliable. Um, and so um, there may be, in fact, ways for some things, and here's, I think, where the distinction that you drew between search goods, um, experience goods, and credence goods, I think is, is really useful. For goods that have at least some of these search characteristics, in other words, where what you're interested in, what you're concerned with, is ultimately observable, and that may be something that can change with technology. There may be alternatives to a formal certification. Where that's not the case, and, and the more you go to its credence goods, that becomes more and more the concern, uh, they are, I'm afraid, we're still a little slim on alternatives. So I think I have a two-part question. So the first is, um, is there empirically a, a distinction um, within different markets as to um, where you see more willingness to jump on a certification bandwagon? So is this more common for sort of high-end luxury items as opposed to the, um, the everyday kinds of items? And, and thinking if, my, if the social value I want to achieve has to do with human rights and fair labor standards, for example. So then, um, are more coffee manufacturers going to get on the fair trade label, or are you going to see this more in, in um, sort of higher end luxury items, like um, jewelry, uh, for example? And then, then the second part of that question has to do with, because every company wants to do better than its competitors, within its particular market. Um, is there, is sort of a competition that exists once you, within the companies, or among the companies that are already on that particular bandwagon? Um, are there any potential detrimental effects coming from their competition? So one example has to do with um, a jewelry company. So on the one hand, you have the jewelry companies that don't talk about having conflict-free diamonds or anything, but they talk about the, the beauty of their diamonds and you know, their quality and how you get the best value for your money. Then you have the companies who say, look, we use um, sapphires sourced from these uh, cooperatives in Sri Lanka, and so all the miners get a fair share of the profits, and we use Canadian diamonds, which are ethically certified. Then you, and we use recycled medical, uh, recycled metal. And then you have a third company that says, oh, those companies that tell you they use Canadian diamonds and all this, well, that's kind of greenwashing because Canadian diamonds really aren't that ethical. And we use recycled metal too, but we do um, lab-created gemstones, so you know they're ethical. Mm -hmm. And so that's how they try and differentiate their products from each other. And, and so as a consumer, then, it becomes a lot more nuanced what's the most ethical uh, <coughs> product. And, and so um, could that have unintended consequences just leading to consumers saying, well, I don't really know, maybe maybe none of this is ethical, and so I, I don't want to deal with any of these companies. 
Yes, certainly there's been some sense as I've been watching through the headlines over the last, you know, in this area, particularly related to food over the last few years, I, I think there's at least a, a growing worry about consumer skepticism that, you know, this, this week it's food miles and next week it's, you know, my food's got to be certified low water input and, you know, can't it just, can't you just tell me which one I should buy and no, you can't because there is, these really are in some sense, uh, to some extent, incommensurable. I don't know, but the, the question about what, you know, when you first asked about which kinds of goods tend to, my first thought was, yeah, it's going to be tend to be things that you can sell to people who are less price sensitive. But then, yeah, coffee is a great counterexample. It's like, it's a, an absolute commodity, or has been an absolute commodity, and is, you know, consumed by just about everybody and all socioeconomic brackets. But it's been the place, it's been one of the most successful cases of, of a certification brand. And that's what, you know, that's what fair trade yeah. is, right? It's a private label brand taking off uh, like crazy. Yeah, but largely, largely two middle and upscale markets. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the coffee that's being sold as fair trade is being sold to middle and upscale markets, not yeah. not to not the, your yeah. everyday grocery store buyer. That's true. That's true. And it's the two media cup rather than the fifteen nine cents. Of yeah. Coffee. Yeah. That, yeah. So yeah. it's so I think I think your initial instinct is Just probably right. right. Yeah. I think it's typically goods that are being sold to higher educated. Uh, sense, sort of these morally sensitive buyers, these part of segment of buyers that come morally from sensitive and price insensitive. And price insensitive. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You, you put those two things together, and then um, and if, if companies are trying to target that market, then this is something they're going to think about. Um, there are probably other luxury good, goods producers who don't, who aren't targeting that market, but have other luxury goods that they're willing to sell and quite sell to people who aren't that sensitive about these issues could be part of off buying large yachts and other things and they're not uh, paying too much attention to how much the fuel they're burning in the yacht. Uh, but um, so my guess is there's a kind of there's a certain segment. Um, and if you fit that segment, then this stuff works. And if you don't fit that segment, maybe not. Now other certifications, I mean certainly kosher goes for a different I mean that's a slightly different segment. Um, but it's so there are different certifications for different values, and as you were pointing out earlier, and different people want different things. Vegan will go for a slightly different segment as well. Um, so, so I think those are one of the ones you made in the beginning actually is that part of what these schemes do is set the agenda essentially. Yes, put an, put an issue out there to raise consumer awareness about it. If they, the more they're successful in that, the more they may actually create exactly the problem that you're concerned about, right? Yes. to create an incentive essentially for a whole number of competing uh, schemes that try to certify something very similar but either differentiate on the details of what exactly is being certified or differentiate it on the level of enforcement and how costly it quite is to become certified as compliant um, sometimes out of a sense of commercial competition sometimes because it quite genuinely raises a whole host of different issues and, and for reasons of competing values, some people care much more about the one aspect than the other. Um, and this is not necessarily always um, with, with bad intent that you have these, uh, th this kind of competition, but it, it, it happens all the more. Now, there's one other issue that I wanted to sort of emphasize that most of the really good, credible certifications actually do cost a fair bit of money. Um, and so one of the consequences that they often have, uh, f at least for products that can be and previously have been produced on a relatively small scale um, in developing countries by uh, producers that are often not in a situation to really um, cooperate with each other and coordinate so as to form cooperatives of some sort, um, it means that the sort of fixed cost of certification for each and every one of them becomes so high that the certification actually pushes them out of the market. And that certification then has the, from the perspective of at least the civil society groups that often have pushed for in the first place, perverse effect um, of privileging actually large producers and, and creating greater inequalities uh, within the developing country societies that often they actually wanted to help. That's been one of the criticisms of fair trade coffee, right? Is that it's is that the smallest, poorest coffee producers just can't can't begin to meet the standards 
Um, and what, one of the when they add organic, the, the, right? And that even fair that trade alone is, is simply about the payment of organic ads, right? One, standards. One of the uh, my sort of uh, <clears throat> something I probably should have written something more serious about, but something I, I threw away in a blog entry last year or the year before was that I said if you if you really care about all of the different value dimensions of your product, you need somebody you need to rely on a company that's extremely good at managing and tracking its supply chain. Right, and so what's the best company on earth at managing its supply chain and tracking it? It's Walmart. Oh, yeah. So, you know, which and of course, you know, the people who are most concerned about the most of these value dimensions are the people who least want to have anything to do with Walmart. There's mm -hmm. kind of a, a cruel irony there, right? That it's it's only very big, hyper efficient companies are going to be able to tell you, you know, not just whether your food was you know organic, but whether it was shade grown, whether it was fair trade, whether it was. Um, you know, had, had eight or ten different value characteristics. It's hard enough to track one, let alone the ten or twenty you might care about. I want to talk about coffee too. It's late in the afternoon. Um, so, so Green Mountain is a good citizen because they pay a premium to their to their suppliers. On the other hand. Last year, maybe they didn't cook the books, but maybe they ran it through a French press. <laughs> so, is there any research that talks about whether certification suffers if the corporation performs as a bad player in the market, or vice versa? If the goodwill that they that they accrue overcomes bad price, is there any financial benefit to being a good citizen? Research seems to be mixed on that, uh, and and so there's there have been different studies that have come out with different conclusions about the benefits of being um, socially responsible. And in the broad in different sense, sense. In the broad sense. sense, yeah, in the broad sense. And so I don't, and I haven't seen anything specific on, on things like adopting certain patients, uh, like fair trade coffee, whether whether that um, gives you any sort of hit in terms of goodwill that. Profitable. It does. There are these studies about being able to charge premiums for these products and that kind of thing, but, but not, not in terms of, uh, of goodwill. Um, it's, uh, it seems to me it could cut, it, in theory, I mean, it could cut either way, right? So, so having that halo and then being discovered engaging in misconduct um, might, might even lead to more serious disappointment um, among people who thought, oh, we thought you were good, but, uh, you know, this is, this is pretty pretty sleazy, pretty sleazy behavior. I wrote a case study many years ago on a, uh, an organization that um, was started by Ben Cohen of, of Ben and Jerry's. It was called Community Products, and he produced a candy called Rainforest Crunch. And they sold the candy back to the company who put in the ice cream, and they also sold it separately as a candy. Um, they claimed on the box that all the nuts were, were uh, bought from a rainforest cooperative, um, and these were Brazil nuts and cashews. And it was, it was the rainforest, cultural survival nonprofit that worked with um, indigenous folks, and in this case, though, it happened to be uh, um, rubber tappers and other folks who were who brought and produced and made this cooperative. Um, set up the nut growing cooperative, but the cooperative couldn't keep up with the demand. This was, you know, Ben kept getting interviewed all over the place. People wanted to buy the candy, um, and so they started buying nuts on the open market. And uh, sure enough, some years later. Um, Paul Hawken was hired by Ben and Jerry Zink to do a social audit. And he did a social audit of the company and he looked at the suppliers, including Community Products Inc. And he said, wait a second, 90% of these nuts are bought on the open market, not from this, not from this cooperative. Um, and uh, it, you know, Ben and Jerry survived, Community Products Inc. didn't survive. Um, and ben Cohen was on the cover of Inc. magazine shortly after that, holding a box of the candy, and it said Ben's big flop. And it was a it was a real embarrassment to to the to the company. And I, and I think it um, for that small company, it certainly it certainly hurt. Now Ben and Jerry's had a lot of momentum. Unilever came in and bought them, and then you know they, they they're still still going under Unilever. But uh, but in that case, uh, you know I think a lot of people who believed in that little company didn't believe in a bunch anymore.
put a different, larger scale version of that is playing out with organic food, right? I mean, America's organic producers can't keep up with America's demand for organic food, so now it's being brought in from China, right? Which now brings more certification problems, or at least mistrust problems, whether it's. Yes. You know, so WikiLeaks, you know, so here, so journalism, anybody with a camera, any employee can blow the whistle so easily on this. You know, I wonder what, because that kind of technology in parallel to all the things we're talking about, is it service kind of a, any kind of check on behavior when somebody knows that your employees, employees increasingly are not loyal to organizations, they're loyal to themselves. You know, how does that play into this? That's, that's an interesting question, because I'll tell you this, the, the Ben and Jerry's uh, thing, and there was a lot more to it than I described, came out uh, during, this was before WikiLeaks and all this, during a deposition uh, for unfair dismissal. So Ben had fired one of the co-managers of this community products team, and he filed a lawsuit, the person who was fired. And in a deposition, he revealed all of this stuff, and, and somehow that deposition became public, an investigative reporter got hold of it. And, and so a lot of the stuff came out, and in addition to Paul Hawkins' audit, there was, it was so workers had gotten rashes because some of the nuts came contaminated. Um, they had the Listeria uh, infection, they had destroyed batches of nuts, all sorts of problems because this cooperative just it wasn't very experienced at producing and shipping nuts. Um, and uh, and so it, it was this if, if he had wanted to, or the fellow was fired, he probably could have been snapping pictures, doing other things. Could have gone to WikiLeaks. This could have been. Yeah, you know, I think the New York Times today there was an article about somebody a spin-off from WikiLeaks, opening a nonprofit to to provide releases around things that are less suspect. But it's likely there are going to be more of these kind of popping up. Well, I heard somebody. This was just um, so I was at a major conference a couple weeks ago, and um, the argument being made to corporate executive there was the, the old, you know, we've all heard the old you know, front page of the newspaper argument, and this fellow was saying, nowadays with the WikiLeaks, you know, there's a higher probability now that whatever you do, whatever memo you write, whatever email you send, whatever is going to show up yeah. on WikiLeaks. It may not be the front page of the newspaper. You know, yeah, online and, you know, exactly. And, and it's, you know, this is now real. We used to use that argument all the time in teaching business ethics and you do whatever, you know, you make sure whatever you do, you're comfortable with it being on the front page of the newspaper. Um, but a lot of people knew, oh, you yeah, know, that's not going to happen. Now, <laughs> and I, I think you're right. There was a story of this position, he was stitching. When he stopped stitching, he was blogging. Yep. You know, so he said, I have two roles here. You know, so one was this function, but the other was a very active getting the information out. Yeah, that's right. People are blogging, texting all the time. Yeah, so it may well be that that sort of internal mon monitoring, now that you have these additional sort of technological conduits, there are other ways for information, there are other things for producers to be uh, concerned about, and that is the... Uh, yeah, when nothing's private, yeah. is everything public? I mean, and what impact does that have on behavior? Other than, you know, what is it? Well, we'll, well see, we'll see what... Up for the I gotta turn that thing off. Sorry about that. <laughs> Uh, there's a cricket in the room, I think. Sorry. One of the questions I'm trying to ask you about is the issue of greenwashing. You've written a little yeah. bit about that, Kristen. And <coughs> fairwashing is something that I've also... What fair washing, washing fair which washing. is fair trade, you know. So things like um, when a company like Starbucks buys a little bit of their product in very ethical ways, but it kind of, you know, then the whole company gets painted as a very ethical company because they participated in this, and, and you know we see it in lots of other places, but Starbucks is one that, that frequently gets talked about in this vein, that you, know, you feel good about buying coffee from Starbucks because they talk about shade grown, fair, you know, all of these various things that they're doing ethically, but how much of what they're purchasing from producers, how much of their relationship to producers is really being conducted in an ethical way, um, and how can we as consumers discern those sorts of distinctions in the marketplace? Uh, 
Which part of that do you want me to? There's, well, there's I mean, a lot. There's a lot. I mean, there's a, a lot there. A I mean, just you know, is there anything there that, that you want to comment yeah. on? Is there is there a ray of is there a ray of hope in yeah, that? Yeah, I certainly think there's. What leads to cynicism, so that we do just go. Yeah, I've certainly been. Stuff. You know, I've been worried about about greenwashing in the past and the way that you know, it's the basically greenwashing. If you're not terribly familiar with the term, at least, at least the way I've defined it is, is that it's it consists. It's closely analogous to whitewashing, right? When you whitewash something, you don't make something go away, but you cover it with something. Prettier, and like, likewise, when you greenwash something, you're not lying, but what you're doing is you're putting something else up on display, some little true environmentally good thing you did, to distract people from a, a tawdry history or a history of uh, worse performance. And there's certainly room for that, and I think that's one of the one of the one of the worries about certifications when people overinterpret them, right? So when people say, "Look, well, it's organic." What more could you want to know? Or it's kosher. What more do you want to know? Well, actually, a lot more. Right? And both of those have been in, in the news in the last six months because people have said, well, sure, it's kosher. But what about labor standards? What about all kinds of other stuff? Uh, and so um, I mean, that's just one of the first ones that comes to mind. But and I think the same has been true with organic, too, right? Is that the organic standard, has very, it's, a very, it's a fairly well, clearly defined standard, but it doesn't say anything about animal cruelty. It doesn't say anything about all kinds of other things that people uh, pay attention to, and so if what you're holding up is your big USDA organic sign or your whatever other certification you've got, your fair trade sign, um, there's a worry from a third party point of view that the consumer is going to think, ah, that's the ethical company, where it's one of 20 different dimensions of ethics that I care about about a given product. Even if you are only looking on the single dimension, there are lots of labels that actually require 80% or 90% of the inputs to be, say, I think organic, organic does. Or, yeah. I, I forget what exactly the threshold is for like 95% or something like that. But, you know, you, yeah. organic since there's variation organic. on it, most consumers don't know what it actually means, what, what are the standards stand behind it, it becomes very difficult to really make a, a truly informed choice just on the basis of seeing one label or another. And that's for even relatively simple standards. If you get something like, what, you know, my favorite one to pick on genetically modified, you know, it's very unclear what that, it's, e it's even clear from a scientific point of view what should ideally that should mean um, and whether the public understands, you know, well, the general public doesn't get much about genetics, so having them understand what it means for something to be free of genetic modifications is uh, a tough one. So I wonder if anybody's looked at it, is it's simply kind of a natural evolving process, so at first blush organic, whenever, whenever that started, you can put out kind of a pin shield, but as people get educated, you know, it begins to kind of deepen the, the conversation so that it's actually never definitive, but it's simply a part of a dynamic kind of evolving process. Well, certainly the standard, I mean, the standards may evolve but very, very slowly because they're kind of set in stone, right? USDA or DA, DA organic, you can go look it up on their website. There is a clear definition of what it means. So there's an Walmart. evolving conversation about what people want. When somebody that's down a slope like Walmart that puts out that it does something, it's very hard to roll that back. And I mean, in some way, there's almost like a commitment of some part of the culture to a different kind of standard that starts a, a dialogue and expectation that was never really there before. Yeah. My, my friend Andrew Potter, who's a, he's a, a philosopher journalist, he's a, got a PhD in philosophy, his, his latest book um, is called The Authenticity Hoax, and in one part of that book he makes the claim that basically what we're seeing here, he doesn't deny that there's lots of well-intentioned um, certification and certification seeking, but he says one of the things that you sort of have to suspect that's going on is kind of status seeking, right? Where, you know, 10 years ago it used to be pretty cool, you would identify yourself a certain way if you identified as vegetarian. And then a few years later, no, it had to be organic. And then later, you know, then two years ago, it had to be local if you really wanted to show you understood social issues related to food. And then, it, now this year it has to be artisanal. <laughs> <laughs> and it has to be, so you can, you know, it's, it's to the point where, you know, you say, oh, merely local, that's, but what kind of local, right? I have to, I have to show that I'm part of the foodie intelligentsia by having hyper, hyper, hyper specific norms uh, so there, I think, and I think he doesn't, again, that's only part of one of the forces, but I think there is some room to see that there is some of that going on, uh, certainly. So, yes. that, it's, so that's part of the social evolution. Teddy Roosevelt saved all the land and talked about saving species, and then 
went to Africa and shot 500 animals, you know, that would probably wouldn't happen. I mean, there's a certain standard set that when it becomes very public, you uh, have inconsistency on does the public hold people to you? Like Walmart, is it going to be easier to shut up Walmart for people in Chapel Hill now to do yeah, this? Yes, but some people also, you know, and you know, part of Andrew's hypothesis is that, well, you know, there goes, there goes, goes organic as anything like a status symbol, right? Or Walmart, now that, the, now that the great unwashed has access to it, it can't be a status it's symbol anymore, so now you've got to have, you know, local artisanal because there's nothing. I think we have time for one more sure. question. So I just want to throw another sort of dimension into the room because I think we've talked a lot about sort of the obligations of the public goods creators to sort of creating, allowing the autonomous, atomistic consumer to do all, to make all the choosing that they want, but it sort of, I think to some extent lets off the consumer for being responsible for sort of maybe a higher level of vigilance. I mean, this is something I, I certainly have seen in kosher and would say that like, you know, kosher consumers and the really, really hardcore ones are really, really hardcore and they're sort of holding the feet to the fire of certifiers to at least be credible in uh, when they're sort of, when somebody's posting the wrong symbol, you know, they're sort of doing their homework, so to speak. And I just wonder if people want to reflect on sort of like, what's the job of the regular consumer? Are we supposed to just sit around and be you know watchers of information that's given to us. Like, what is what is the job of the consumer in all of this? That's a great question. I think different consumers are obviously going to take the job with different degrees of seriousness. And as you described, the kosher consumers, my guess is, there's a whole spectrum. Um, of the, those who are really serious that are going to hold the feet to the fire. And we need some consumers like that in each of these spaces because and it's gonna, it doesn't take every consumer to, to, to hold the organization's feet to the fire, but it does take a certain number. So you've got to have enough people uh, with each of these certification categories uh, who are going to get serious enough to say this is not a serious certification, this is, or who are going to uh, raise issues about them. Um, one of the nice things about being in this um, internet age is that people can share that information um, easily if they find a flaw or a problem with a, an existing certification, um, and can can get that out there. And these things can can start to we can start to have a, a discussion about whether a certification is really credible, or valuable, or useful. Um, and you know, if you want to go out and buy Oriental rugs or um, sustainably harvested fish or something else, you can you can start to get information um, and and to get better and better search engines, I'm sure, to sort through this stuff to, to help help us sort through the and get credible information. But um, I think if you get a, at least a, some kind of cadre of folks, so and this is one of those uh, kind of ethical problems where you don't need everybody to have the same level of responsibility. But you need some people to have that responsibility to have that vigilance. So it's hard to say every consumer has this responsibility, but. I would, I would like to live in a world where some consumers on each of these issues are passionate enough to really to be that vigilant because the rest of us are counting on it. Um, and that's, you know, and so some of us have to do it for some things, some for other things, and then the rest have to, have to rely on that kind of vigilance. Uh, but, but we all can't do it for everything. I think it would just, that would be overwhelming. Um, but I hope that some of us will do it for each of these, each of these things, and when we find out things, share it. That's the only way to, for the rest, you know, to save the labor of everybody else trying to, everybody testing every certification would just be, uh, that, that would be horrendous. That would be, so I think we've got to find a, we got to find a more efficient way to do it. But I think some people, some consumers could really have to, to be as vigilant as those, uh, the, those who really deeply care about culture. To the extent that you agree with the normative agenda of those who feel really intensely about it, it is great to have them, right? because they essentially provide the additional monitoring services that provide the credibility of the certifier. Um, but, I mean, that was part of the point in trying to parse apart these three sets of stakeholders, right? That there are power relationships that are at work here. And, and uh, even when something might seem normatively relatively simple, if we actually increase the cost of food, never mind for all the other reasons that are currently uh, widely debated of, of shortages that are going to be driving prices up in the years to come. Uh, but if we increase, increase the price of food simply by 
forcing everybody to have increasingly only choices available to them that are ethically good, and therefore kids go without the food, the ethical choice becomes a lot more complicated. Um, and, and the same goes, I think, for many other products. It's, it's not always clear that everybody should necessarily have all these additional values piled on top of huh. consumption But choices. I never understood that in terms like during World War II, certainly in London, when you couldn't ship food in, they'd be bombed and people started gardens, it was just certainly local. You know, or just have those small spaces or... So I don't know that that actually goes one with the other in terms of... Well, there is real poverty in the world. So uh, anything you do that mean that those poor countries actually can't be producers. Some have more options that way than others, but certainly anything anything that drives up food prices means some kids go hungrier, right? And especially if we if you have to incrementally increase food prices, not just for you know so that food is ethical, but so that for each dimension along which somebody is sufficiently concerned that you know the food now has to have all of these different certifications, right? So. You know, I mean, some of these are, and that's the other thing I would I would want from consumers is for them to appreciate that there are value dimensions that they care passionately about, and then there are other value dimensions that are um, that they're not going to compromise on. Right? There's a difference between caring about something and not willing to compromise on it. I think you know, child slavery is sort of one of the easy cases. Right? I was kind of playing a bit skeptical, saying there's all these different dimensions. We all care about different things about our food. Child slavery is one of the easy cases. Nobody should be buying anything made with child slavery. Child labor, well, tougher topic because there are cases where probably ch some child labor is ethically okay. It's sad, but ethically okay. So there are going to be different value dimensions that we care about in our food, some of which we're going to say, well, I understand that you're passionate about that issue, but I'm, I think the, you know, the ethics there is a little less clear, so I'm not going to be too hung up on that one. But when it comes to this one, I think, you know, you want, and I think a smart consumer is not just informed about the topics, but understands that not all issues are, you know, uh, uh, sort of stopping points in America. And speaking of stopping points, uh, that's, a, that's a good conclusion. Thank you very much. Produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.